Go ahead, have a seat. Today our text is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been buried, baptized with Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved by sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, earlier in Romans, in Romans chapter 1, Paul announces the theme of the entire letter to the church in Rome, that it's the gospel is God's power for salvation because it shows the righteousness of God is through faith for all who believe. Now, I have always loved Romans 6. It has just this great concept of of the, the old life that we've lived put to death and a new life a life abundant and a life actively engaged in our faith, walking in this newness of life. It's a letter about second chances. Well, and maybe second chances is is far too few. Let's say multiple chances, new beginnings. That's what this book and this letter is all about. Now, this past week, digging deeper and deeper and deeper into this text gave me a newfound love and appreciation for it, but it also really highlighted the fact that in this letter, there is this strong paradox, right? And a paradox is when you have two truths that seem like they're against each other, and there's tension with those two truths. And so we're going to dig into that tension today. And and usually when I speak and I share God's word, I love the fact that the law then is, is, is healed and made whole and full in Christ. In the gospel, all of our wounds get healed. But today, there's no resolution. Today, there's the tension. And that tension is the Christian walk, the Christian life right here and right now. So here's the first truth. The first truth that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6 is that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. This is the first truth that he talks about. We know that, this is Paul, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now what in the world does it mean to be dead to sin? Does it mean that now I have the capacity to not sin? Or does it mean that I have the capacity to not sin because God gives me the power of life in Christ to resist temptation, which I just don't do perfectly? After all, there's many areas in my life that I've worked very, very hard to improve. And I do so much better than I used to. But then when you start thinking about that, about how how much better we are than we used to be, then all of a sudden now pride swings and comes into play, and now pride leads us back into sin, and now we've got sin back in our lives. What does it mean to die to sin? Paul says, you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul wants us to know that we should dread sin. Right? Sin should be repulsive to us. Paul draws this conclusion in, in verse 12, the verses right after our text for today. Paul says this, Do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life 
and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. This is that newness of life that Paul is talking about. As Paul says, we are to walk actively, live out our faith each and every day. There's a theologian named Cranefield who defines three different ways to think about being dead to sin. The first one, he says, is this. They died to sin in God's sight when Christ died on the cross with their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he died that death for us, and our sins at that point in time were dead. We are dead to sin because of Christ on the crucifixion. Number two, another way. They died and were raised up in their baptisms, individually, personally. That in our baptisms, as Paul writes in in this text in Romans, we are baptized into his death. Baptism is that which connects us to the death of Christ and puts our sins to death. Number three, another way he describes it is, is we are called, having been given the freedom, to die daily and hourly to sin by the death of our sinful natures and to rise daily and hourly to this newness of life in obedience to God. This is a moment-to-moment dying and rising. It's a continual act that continues through our lives. So let's stop talking so much. Paul would say, stop talking so much about the sin. You have died to sin. Instead of talking about that, what we should be talking about is this newness of life, what it means to live out our faith each and every day actively, boldly, being new, being different, being fresh and righteous in seeking to obey God's laws. So what does that look like for you? Are there places that you'd like to go that are not spiritually good places? Are there people that you enjoy spending time with that don't increase and nurture your faith? In fact, they lead you to temptation. Are there places you go online as you surf the internet that that only satisfy your lusts momentarily? Or provide you an opportunity to rant about the latest political scandal? See, when we are living in this newness of life, When your hearts are awakened to the power of life in Christ, you spend more time with your family. When your hearts are awakened to the power of life in Christ, you dig deeply and drink deeply from the word of God. When your hearts awaken to the power of life in Christ, you live your life looking for ways to sacrifice for other people. And you daily, continually come to God in repentance and receive his grace and mercy. There is this slavery to sin that Paul talks about when we are gripped by the strength of that sin to the fight, to it's just, it's inescapable. And we're held tight by it and it controls our lives and it, it directs our life and it, it condemns our life. And it separates us from God. That's when you are enslaved to sin. But when you are set free, when you put your sin to death, and you wake up and live your life for Christ actively and boldly, well, then Jesus has a grab hold of your life. And his love grips you so tightly that nothing can take you out of his hands. And you are empowered to live in a new way, to glorify him. And you're connected with him for eternity. Now, I'd like to keep it really simple and say that in this text, we're taught that, that Jesus, through his power, he releases us freely from our sin. We're dead to our sin, that we're just dead to the consequence of it, right? The, the consequence, the eternal consequence, the death that we would experience and separation that we would experience without God with sin in our lives. But that's not what Paul writes. See, not only are we set free from the consequence of sin we are set free from sin it is no longer has any bearing or control on your life see we were buried with him into baptism into death in order that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father we too might walk in a newness of life we too might walk in a newness of life we too might 
walk in a newness of life. That might sound a little bit like, well, maybe. <laughs> the English translation is really poor here. Because the Greek text in the verb tense directs this as, as, as not a, a possibility, but a certainty. A surely. If you have been baptized and buried with Christ and rise with him, you will most definitely, positively, surely walk in a newness of life. And maybe we need to do a better job of doing that. Maybe the newness of our walk with Christ needs improvement. And the law would have us focus on those areas. What do we need to work on? What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? So that's one truth that Paul talks about, which comes into play then with the second truth that causes tension with this first truth. And that is, we still sin every day. Sometimes every moment of every day. And that truth is in tension with that concept that Paul talks about being dead to sin. Hebrews chapter 10, the author says this, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment. You see, if you, if you approach this whole concept of sinning as, well, if I'm going to sin anyways, and Jesus loves to forgive my sin, then I'm going to do Jesus a favor and sin like crazy so that I can just experience more and more and more of God's grace. That's called cheap grace. And the author of the Hebrews says, there's nothing but judgment if that's what you think grace is all about. You don't get it. But we still have to acknowledge that there is sin in our lives. If we were to keep reading Paul's letter to the church in Rome into, verse, into chapter 7, we'd hear Paul say this, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want that's what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You see, there's still sin in me, even if I'm dead to sin. Now, if sin is still in us, then we have to ask that question, have we truly died to our sin? Or do we just simply just not worry about it and know that Jesus will forgive us? Paul actually tosses that question out into the room and then he says, surely not. The Greek has this concept of don't even let that thought originate in your head. Get rid of it. We have been baptized into Jesus' death. Now, there's a strong connection to one of the measures that we value here at St. Luke's as, as to what does it mean to be a disciple here. And we have a life of renewal, a life of sacrifice, a life of joy. But today, that connects with this life of freedom. That we have been set free from the law. We've died to sin. And that means we are free to boldly live for him. And yet, sin is still a part of who we are. It's still a part of our lives. It still pokes its head back up out of those baptismal waters. Luther likes to talk about this old Adam, our sinful past, is, is drowned in the waters of our baptism, but he still kind of has death throes and he pushes his head up from time to time. And Luther says we're supposed to take his head and push it back down under the water every time we remember our baptisms. As I said before, during the invocation of our service, we start the, the services every single week in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not just acknowledging that he is here with us, but remembering for ourselves our own baptisms and what God has done for us in that moment to wash us clean, to separate us from our sin, to connect us to his death on the cross, to take away our sin, wash us clean and make us his son or daughter. Every time we start those, a worship service in the name of the Trinity, remember your baptism. It tells you who you are. It tells you what your identity is. It tells you what your mission and your purpose is. It reminds you to walk in this newness of life. Now, if we look at Romans 6 through 8, 6, 7, and 8 as a whole unit, there's this whole 
now, but not yet, tension. That now we are set free from sin, but we still have the effect of sin in our lives. But they no longer reign. Sin no longer reigns over us. It no longer controls, directs, dictates, and condemns our lives. But they still affect it. It's important to acknowledge that sin still exists, but it no longer reigns. There's no longer any condemnation from the law for those in Christ. But we continue to be constantly frustrated by our inability to live out the law perfectly. Now here's where I struggle. I I love preaching a message that's full of law and then bathed in grace at the end. And and I leave feeling, (sighs) I hope that some of you do too. Today is not one of those days. Because there's that tension And the purpose of that tension is not to resolve it and make it feel better. The purpose of that tension is to embrace it, to lean into it, and to understand that that's what the Christian walk is. We are dead to sin. But until Jesus comes back, we will always have elements of it in our life. We will always need to come to him continually, remembering our baptisms daily, even momentarily, Coming to him in confession, receiving his absolution. Yearning and stressing and pressing on for this newness of life that we have now, but not yet in full. So today, if you leave, like I've left the last two services, with a little bit of tension, good. Embrace it. Lean into it. That's the life that we are to live today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Paul to the church and and your way of speaking through him. God, remind us more and more that we are indeed dead to sin. Give us your power to live in this newness of life, to be able to resist temptations that have dug their claws into our souls, to be able to be released and set free. And also allow us to recognize and acknowledge that sin still has a presence. And while it doesn't reign in our lives, it still affects us. We praise you for the ability that you've given to us to come to you daily in repentance, to be washed clean in the waters of our baptismal remembrance and washed clean by your body and blood. Father, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.